Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Naomi and Greg for uh, having me uh, give this talk. It's a real privilege. And uh, also for Chris Bel to Chris Belden, uh, who is not here. He's at a WMO meeting uh, in Japan. Um, so I'm not going to repeat the title of the talk, probably the longest uh, title out of all. Um, but I would like to acknowledge a very long list of uh, collaborators um, that we're, we're putting together a collaborative team uh, amongst multiple agencies to tackle this very thorny issue of how we should best assimilate uh, different uh, sets of satellite data in high-resolution hurricane models. Uh, so I'll just provide a quick, a very brief overview of the data coverage, uh, satellite data coverage in global models. Um, I think Mark gave a very nice introduction, so I can skip some of that, except to just talk about the volumes. Uh, and then talk about some new satellite data simulation research. Uh, it's very much in its nascent stages, so I kind of feel that this is very undeveloped uh, compared with um, many of the other uh, presentations that have preceded this. And I'll wrap up with discussion, discussing some of the synergies with uh, other programs and potential collaborators. Um, so the NCEP system uh, assimilates a lot of satellite data. I won't read them out. A lot of radiance data, scatterometer data, uh, wind data, everything else. Um, I pulled this out of uh, uh, one of the, uh, the, the talks by the NCEP data assimilation group, uh, really to emphasize just the proliferation of satellite data uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so. So um, there's been f five, more, five order of magnitude uh, increase uh, in the data coverage uh, that's expected between 2000 and, uh, and five years' time. And um, in terms of the percentage of data that's ingested uh, into models, uh, NCEP uses about 2% of all the available data. There's a lot of thinning that goes on, a lot of super um just to handle the sheer uh, volume of data. And um, about uh, 5 million uh, data points are assimilated uh, per day. So it's an enormous volume, and actually with ECMWF, it's fairly similar. They assimilate the order of millions of uh, satellite data points uh, each cycle or each day. And um, also, it's really worth noting that, uh, uh, that of all the assimilated data in the ECMWF system, um, about 90% uh, of those, or over 90% of those, are from satellites. So really, the global models are very, very heavily reliant on the assimilation of satellite data, and the treatment of uh, those satellite data are a very key component, and uh, operational centers have uh, very large groups uh, working on how to, uh, how to uh, keep on improving these uh, as their data assimilation schemes evolve, too. Um, in regional models, it's a different story, and uh, this is the only slide that I have on operational regional, regional models simulating satellite data, because uh, just not a lot happens, particularly when it pertains to hurricanes. Uh, the uh, non-hurricane uh, NMM model assimilates a subset of all the satellite data that goes into the GFS, um, but nothing at really high resolution. Um, for hurricane modeling, that of course, well, the reason that we're here is that we want to make better predictions of hurricane intensity and structure with the higher resolution models. And, um, well, as we know, uh, GFDL uses a bogus uh, vortex initialization method um, that has proven to be uh, uh, somewhat effective, but it could also uh, probably benefit from uh, simulation of, data, of satellite and in situ data nearer the core. Uh, so HWARF has attempted to advance upon the GFDL method. Uh, the first few steps are the same, that essentially there's an interpolation from the GFS analysis uh, onto the HWARF domain then the weak GFS vortex is ripped out, and then a new uh, vortex that's spun up by the HWARF is then stuck in. And uh, the, um, uh, through the GSI, that's the NCEP data assimilation scheme, uh, uh, data could be uh, assimilated in the HWARF system. So there are plans afoot for that to uh, go ahead uh, operationally. Uh, however, the current status, and this was just lifted out of the uh, HWARF tutorial report that Gopal and company uh, recently wrote, uh, is, is that the um, observational data on a hurricane scale are not operationally ingested in HWARF, and therefore the impact of using the data assimilation scheme on HWARF is very small. 
so this brings us to, uh, uh, to research and what we're trying to do to address this. And um, uh, Chris Feldon's a PI on uh, a NOT project, and uh, myself and several others uh, in this room uh, and uh, outside are involved. And essentially, we're trying to tackle a bunch of different pieces of a puzzle here. So here's just the full flowchart for, um, for the assimilation forecast system. So we have the satellite uh, QC and observational uh, operators here. And selected satellite observations will then be assimilated in uh, one of the state-of-the-art uh, assimilation schemes, the ensemble Kalman filter. Um, uh, there are many versions of ensemble Kalman filter being developed at different centers. Uh, we're using the one that's been developed uh, at NCAR, but in principle it could be used with any uh, ENKF system. Now, the ENKF provides ensemble initial conditions uh, that can then be integrated forward to give uh, a forecast, uh, a number of forecasts that can be used to give probabilistic forecasts of hurricane intensity, structure, precipitation, and so on. Um, now, uh, ensemble forecast perturbations uh, in the ENKF are also used as first guess fields uh, for the next ensemble Kalman filter uh, uh, step uh, in the cycling. Um, we also have here um, the potential to test different vortex initialization methods. So um, there's several people here, and also Dave Nolan and myself, are working on some simple uh, vortex, initi vortex initialization methods because we're speculating that uh, data assimilation isn't quite mature enough yet to just completely ingest all the data and provide uh, an accurate uh, analysis. So we think that some... Um, initialization, uh, particularly of very intense vortices, might still be needed. So that's just an open question. Uh, so I'd just like to discuss uh, a, a subset of some of the uh, satellite data types that we're uh, investigating. Uh, one is the uh, rapid scan uh, winds, and uh, here's just an example of uh, what the rapid scan can bias. So you're all familiar with the SIMS website, and you see plots like this one in the top left-hand corner um, that basically gives a few of the cloud drift uh, wind vectors uh, uh, at, uh, in the upper levels that are tracing the, uh, uh, the outflow canopy. But there's very little in terms of the, uh, the inner core in the tropical cyclone. However, uh, using a four-minute rapid scan sequence, uh, as is done here, uh, that uh, one can see that there's a lot more wind vectors um, uh, that are, uh, uh, and one can see some cyclonic flow uh, in the uh, innermost core and then uh, better, um, a better defined uh, outer circulation too. And uh, if we derive some divergence fields from this, so this isn't using a simulation, this is just the, uh, the SIMS method of blending uh, the, the wind vectors with no gaps fields, is um, that we notice that uh, in this heavily observed area where we've got these extra wind vectors, uh, that there's actually an increased uh, divergence just north of the cyclone. Uh, this is uh, uh, Typhoon Senlaku uh, in the West Pacific. And uh, associated with that is a stronger anticyclonic vorticity uh, north of the, uh, the cyclone. So this just shows what extra could be bought by these uh, rapid scan vectors. And... Um, we're collaborating with, uh, uh, with NRL on assimilating these, uh, these uh, extra wind vectors into the new NOGAPS 4D VAR uh, assimilation scheme. So results from those will be presented in conferences in the next couple of years. And then we're planning to extend this to the uh, COAMPS TC system that Jim Doyle had discussed. Um, I think I'll skip this in the interest of time uh, and move on to uh, uh, another uh, type of satellite data that hasn't really been ingested into high-res uh, hurricane models. Um, so these are the air's temperature and water vapor soundings, and this is work done by Jun Li of Sims and Hui Liu of uh, NCAR. And uh, this is just a case study that you'll notice that a lot of these are just essentially case studies, but there's nothing that's really been done fully quantitatively over, say, an entire hurricane season to get meaningful statistics. A lot of these are really proof of concept type studies. Uh, they all have major holes in them, but we're all just starting out here. Um, so in this case, um, 
uh, over the period of September 6th to 9th, 2008, um, there was this distribution, so it's a little bit hard to see, of uh, soundings uh, in clear sky, so away from the tropical cyclone. And uh, uh, Chun and Hui did a, a simulation study to uh, identify the data impact of these soundings uh, in the WARF uh, ENKF system. So I won't read out all the satellite data sets or, or other data sets that are going into the control run, except to say that in these two parallel experiments, uh, there's this extra run that sims, uh, with, with the sims uh, T and Q soundings in them. So um, that's the only difference between the two uh, uh, assimilation and forecast runs that I'll be showing on the next slide. So here, um, uh, we see again, this is for Typhoon Senlaku. I think we can ignore this first uh, time here because Senlaku was just a developing depression at, the point, uh, at that point and there was a lot of uncertainty uh, about its center. Um, but if we look at the next uh, couple of steps here and we, uh, basically the, the red is the, the, um, the best track and the green is when the uh, extra soundings are simulated. Uh, the green is certainly closer to the red than the blue. So what this is saying is just in our analyses is that the, the position of the cyclone is being pinned down better by assimilating the extra sounding data. Um, now, uh, on the right-hand panel, we have the... Uh, we, we have the uh, uh, intensity here. Now, one thing we notice is that we're starting from an incorrect intensity uh, at the initial time. And uh, it's problems like that that we still need to, uh, need to address uh, in assimilation studies. Um, and this just shows that there was a, a moderate uh, but not fully satisfactory improvement uh, in the uh, analysis of the intensity. If we're to move on to forecasting, so uh, we uh, then ran 16 member ensembles from the CNKF analysis, and this is just a case that was initialized at 12Z on, uh, on, uh, uh, on 9th of September. Um, a couple of things we see here, looking at the track errors of these ensemble members, is that the um, ensemble mean first up in the SIMS run has smaller errors, and also the uh, ensemble spread uh, about that uh, ensemble mean is generally uh, a little smaller. There are not so many wild uh, tracks uh, uh, with the uh, extra soundings assimilated. Um, the final data set that we'll discuss is a satellite-derived surface winds. So we all know about scatterometers. Uh, then uh, Mark also introduced uh, uh, that, there is, uh, that one can produce wind vectors derived from uh, uh, a combination of data. Uh, and then also one can provide wind speed vectors derived from microwave imagery, uh, such as uh, AMSU. Um, I'm just going to show one example here, um, uh, of, and this also brings up the question about data assimilation schemes themselves. Uh, so it's just an experiment that I did in collaboration with Ryan Torn, and this is when we were just trying to evaluate why uh, the quick scat data were not, being, uh, were not having much of an influence on hurricane track forecasts uh, in the you know, recent versions of GFS system. Uh, so what we do is we went to synthetic observation world, and uh, I created just four synthetic OBS uh, whose uh, wind values were 10 meters per second stronger uh, than the NSEP first guess. And then Ryan Torn uh, heard me present these results and said that uh, he'd like to do a comparison um, between my GSI run and uh, his uh, ENKF analysis. And he just used one wind vector. Now, these are for different storms, but we're really just investigating how the data assimilation modifies the structure of the uh, wind field here. So on the left is uh, my run, and uh, this just basically shows the analysis increment due to assimilating those four wind vectors. And essentially, the influence of assimil assimilating surface winds doesn't extend much above the boundary layer. So that's the operational system as it stands right now. Um, with, uh, uh, with Ryan's ENKF, uh, we actually see that there's a projection from that one satellite, uh, or sorry, that one synthetic orb uh, that projects up through the, uh, the troposphere, and it's basically uh, helping to reposition the vortex and intensify the wind field. So that one surface wind orb actually gives like a quasi-gradient uh, wind balance vortex. 
So it's time to wrap up. So um, our, our collaboration here, that, uh, the, the points we want to emphasize is that uh, uh, Chris Felton and the, the rest of us are interested in using multiple and integrated satellite data sets at the highest satellite resolution, so with no thinning, uh, to assimilate these into high-res uh, analysis forecast systems uh, uh, with a sophisticated data assimilation scheme. Um, a 27 and 9 kilometer resolution framework is probably adequate for our purposes. And I uh, would really like to seek this, this optimal assimilation strategy for multiple data sets concurrently and, uh, and seek potential for operational transition of these findings. Um, I'll just leave up. Uh, there are multiple synergies uh, here with uh, other projects. But uh, what I think that we need really is a combination of continuing these case studies, um, but also some evaluations over longer periods so that we can demonstrate uh, the statistical significance for assimilating multiple combinations of satellite data sets. So I'll close there and thank you very much.